Many sole practitioners want to achieve big results, but when it comes to business, behave more like a freelancer or a contractor. So what would happen if you started to think more like a CEO? This is what I discussed with Janet Murray on this episode of Architecture Business Club, the weekly podcast for solo and small firm architecture practice owners, just like you, who want to build a profitable, future-proof architecture business that fits around their life. I'm the host, John Clayton. If you want to get notified when I release a new episode and get access to free resources and exclusive offers, then go to mrjohnclayton.co.uk forward slash ABC and sign up to my free weekly email newsletter. Now let's dig in to thinking like a CEO. Janet Murray is an online business strategist and copywriter. She's the creator of the 2024 Courageous CEO Strategic Business Planner and Resource Kit, along with a whole host of content kits that save time on content planning and creation, and the host of the Courageous CEO podcast. Janet has been podcasting for around a decade and has published more than a thousand podcast episodes. As a copywriter, Janet specializes in creating and writing strategic copywriting campaigns. She is also a keynote speaker who has spoken on big stages around the world. To grab a copy of Janet's 2024 Courageous CEO Strategic Business Planner and Resource Kit, visit janetmurray.co.uk. Janet, welcome to Architecture Business Club. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, Janet, before we get talking about the topic that we've got in mind today, I've just got to ask you about this. I heard that you you recently started a choir in less than 30 days, which is absolutely incredible. How did that come about? Well, <laughs> uh, when I make a decision, it, it tends to happen quick. But, but basically, I'm a runner as well. Um, so I've had this idea for many years now that it would be amazing. Um, so I've done park run um, every Saturday it would be amazing during December to to uh, see choirs and to have some Christmas music um at the finish um I'm a big sort of believer in 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 just testing things out and and minimum viable product just get it out there so um within I think it was 23 days actually um I had a Facebook page I had a, a full practice backing track we'd had our first rehearsal um and um yeah it, it went well and it's something that I think potentially could be a business idea in the future. But like I say, I'm a big believer in like testing things out, you know, not spending too much time in resources and, and actually getting the, the format and the delivery right, you know, before you, you, you kind of put something out there. So I was able to actually apply a lot of my business skills, but it's still really scary because um, I've done a lot of singing over the years and uh, a lot of music, but I've never led a choir so yeah it was so quite uh yeah quite quite a bit quite scary and and really took took me out of my comfort zone it's good sometimes to push yourself out of your comfort zone though isn't it i think that's absolutely amazing that you managed to get it going so quickly um janet we we met a number of years ago actually i first discovered you actually it was via your podcast which i mentioned in the introduction You've recorded over a thousand podcast episodes, which is absolutely incredible. And your podcast is, was, I discovered it when I was wanting to learn more about marketing because it was an area that was quite a, a weakness of mine. And it was an absolute treasure trove. And it was actually, it was one of the first, if not the first podcast that I ever started listening to. I wasn't yeah. really into podcasts before that. So we have quite a connection there. So it's a huge honor to have you as a guest on my podcast. However, today we're going to talk about something a little bit different. So the time that this is going out, we're, we're at the start of the new year. Um, so this is a perfect time to take a fresh look at how you think about your business and of yourself as a business owner. We're going to talk about CEO mindset. So thinking like a CEO. Um, with that in mind, firstly, in your experience, how do most small business owners think of themselves and their business normally? I think what I've discovered over 10 years of working with small business owners, and I've had actually had my own business for more than 20 years. I was a, a self-employed journalist and editor before that. But what I've discovered is a lot of people behave like freelancers or contractors. And 
And then they they go, oh, like, well, why have I got inconsistent income? Like, you know, why am I not able to predict how much money I've got coming in each month or year? Why is it? Why why are things not growing? Why why are things stagnating? And it's interesting because a lot of people decide to run their own business because they want to leave the corporate lifestyle behind. Yeah. People behave like a sort of, they've got the kind of freelancer contractor mentality. And that is the kind of gig mentality, isn't it? You're getting a new client, you're delivering, and then you're going out looking for more. And it has taken me a long time to be able to kind of articulate this. But I got to the stage in my business where I was getting so many clients who were coming to me for help with marketing and content, because that is kind of like my specialist area. And I was finding they didn't know how to do like basic stuff, like how to get a client or how to, you know, set their financial targets for the year and how to make sure they hit them. And it sounds a bit silly, but, you know, knowing how to get a client or knowing how to get clients, that is far more important than knowing how to set up a Facebook page or an Instagram account or whatever. But a lot of the advice out there will be like, oh, you've started your own business. Oh, you need to get on LinkedIn or you need to be on TikTok or, you know, whatever, YouTube or whatever. And yeah, I mean, having a podcast for me has, you know, it's definitely helped me grow my audience and my network. But there's a couple of things about it that might not, not actually be the best route for you. Uh, there might be quicker and easier ways and ways that are more suited to your personality. Um, and the other side of it is, yes, you know, a lot of us work for ourselves because we don't want to, all that corporate stuff and all the meetings and strategies and targets. But actually, there's a lot of useful stuff in there. You know, if you were to ask um, somebody at sort of C-suite level or you to ask somebody a CEO of a successful business, like what are your financial targets? Like what are your key sales periods? Like, you know, what's coming up? They might not tell you. <laughs> they probably wouldn't because that's commercially <laughs> sensitive data. But they would know. And so I feel like there's a lot of people out there who are kind of expecting CEO results, but actually they're behaving like a freelancer or a contractor. And I should say at this point, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being a freelancer or contractor. That's absolutely fine. But if but if you are going to approach your business in that way, you're going to get that kind of feast and famine and kind of not knowing where your next client's coming from. And so for me, it's all about a CEO of a um, a successful business, a growing business that's, you know, growing in the right direction will be strategic and will be like, okay, what is it that I want to happen here? And what is the best way for me to to get to that destination? And that journey it isn't going to look the same for everybody. And, and just as every business, you know, they're, they're going to be focusing on different things and using different strategies. And the other thing I would say about marketing as well is that a lot of people get confused with marketing. Marketing and content is a tactic. It, it's a tactic the same as, you know, some, some people go to networking meetings or some people buy paid, you know, invest in paid sponsorship or whatever. And the, the crucial thing is, do you know what it is you want to achieve? And then choosing the right strategy. Um, whereas I think a lot of people are the kind of freelancer um, contractor mentality is just kind of like, well, everybody else is getting on TikTok or they're doing LinkedIn or people are trying YouTube. That sounds good. And so you end up doing things without really knowing why you're doing them. So you end up wasting time and then you're like, I'm still not getting regular consistent income. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think so. And um, I mean, it's that's just a, such a common scenario that... Um, folks will decide to start up their own business, whether that's in architecture or any other industry that generally they are doing a job or profession and they'll decide to start their own business and they know how to do the job. But the whole business building side of it and that strategy side of it is usually, often it can be somewhat lacking. It certainly was when I started out with my architecture business. And you end up then you can go down the rabbit hole, particularly with social media. I think sometimes people jump on that bandwagon and do it just because to be seen to be doing it, because that's what everybody else does without that strategy behind it. If that's the way that a lot of small business owners are operating, what's the alternative? What is the different way to think about things um, when it comes to you know, running and growing a successful business? Well, I mean, it, it sounds a bit boring, I suppose, um, but it is about strategy. So it's about, and it, but it's actually really simple. It's a, about sort of looking across the year. So like this is going out, I think, in early 2024 and just starting with those questions like how much do I w want to earn? It's amazing, actually, how many business owners I say, like how much do you want or need to earn? And they, they either don't know or they don't want to say. Um, and there's a difference between how much you 
need to earn, like to cover your, you know, your your basic commitments and and to meet your household commitments, and then what you want to earn. So that's the first thing is like, what is it to, that you you want to earn or need to earn, but also being able to set, set realistic targets. Cause I could like put my thumb in the air now and say, yeah, I want to earn a hundred grand. But like, if I haven't actually thought about how I'm going to get there, a lot of people as well will sort of say they'll pluck a figure out the air and, and it's not based in any data. Again, I, I'm conscious this all sounds really boring. I'm actually quite a creative person, but, but I sort of feel like taking this strategic approach to business, that's what frees you up to be more creative and to experiment and, and you know, and, and try things. And you can't just say, I want to earn a hundred grand or 150 grand. Like, well, what did you earn last year? What did you earn in the last quarter of last year? Like, how was that made up, that income? Like what sort of clients, what sort of contracts? Um, what strategies did you use to get those clients? What worked well? What what didn't what didn't work well? So and, and really, it's about making the right decisions and just making things easy for yourself. But and and it's just taking that big. I often talk about it as being like a photographer and and taking like a wide shot, like across your year, just looking at in three quarters. Okay, like what what's going on? Depending on what industry you're working mainly with, you might find there's certain peak periods. There might be busier times or times where people are more likely. Um, to invest it could be that you know you work it with industries whereby you know they have money to spend in April or they have money to spend in March because they're getting a new budget or whatever so it's about really kind of understanding that rise and fall of your own business now if you're new in business if you've just started as a freelancer or contractor obviously you you may not have that data to draw on um, so again it's probably not a great idea just to go and pluck a figure out of your head it's probably better to start conservatively and then kind of build up from there um, but it's really about just looking at that bigger picture, um, looking at what you need to earn, what you want to earn. If you want to increase on last year, like what's realistic, like, you know, doubling your income might be realistic, but actually what would need to happen? Like how many co- conversations would you need to have? Uh, what strategies would you need to use? And that's the bit when I talk about marketing is that is that people do marketing without really knowing what their goal is. It's about going, what's my goal? And so if I want to you know, earn 50 grand in the next quarter or whatever, what are the best activities for me to do? Um, And it might be that proactive outreach, it might be as simple as making a list of all the people that you've worked with before. uh, And I have templates for this kind of thing in my um, strategic business planner, um, reaching out to them and booking in some calls or whatever. It it may not be as hard as you think. Um, And also thinking about how much time you want to spend on marketing. And because you know, we were just talking before we started recording this about um, about you was talking about creating like video shorts and things to go with this. And, you know, there, there can be actually quite a lot of production time um, in, in terms of doing something like a podcast or a YouTube channel, which is great. You know, uh, that's definitely what doesn't mean it's not worth doing. But you also have to be realistic about not only the time that it will take you, but also how long you would expect to see results. So the other thing is, is asking yourself, like, how soon do I need results? Like, if you want to get clients in the next 30 days, then a YouTube channel or podcast is probably not going to be your priority because, um, you know, some people listen, I don't know about you, John, but some people listen to my podcast for years, like, and yeah. will they buy a thing? You know, like, it, yes, it's great because they're building a relationship and you're building your authority and your credibility, but they're probably not going to listen to one episode or see one social media post and buy. So in the meantime you're going to have to be using some different strategies, which is probably going to be more proactive, like reaching out to people proactively um, and and actually being really good about following up. So I talk about it like a proactive outreach campaign. It might be going to networking. It might be getting yourself along to the right events. But it's really about understanding what it is you need to achieve and crucially, what's the time scale? Because if you're using... Um, so something like a podcast, I wouldn't expect, or social media, I wouldn't expect you to see results before 90 days or certainly not big you know big results often it will take years so if you're using strategies that typically take longer than 90 days to get results and you're expecting money in the bank this month or next month then you're constantly going to be feeling disappointed you're going to be stressed but if you're going okay well yeah you know long term I do need to develop my brand and I, I want to be a thought leader and have authority in my industry. So yes, I will do that podcast or the YouTube or, you know, build my profile on LinkedIn. But actually in the meantime, I, I still need to be um, getting myself clients and getting work lined up. And 
ironically, that's the bit that can free you up to do the more creative stuff as well. You know, like if you're not worrying about where your next client's coming from. Um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So actually spending a little bit of time, maybe doing some of the, maybe for some people, the boring, unsexy type stuff where you sit down with a spreadsheet or a notepad and pen and actually just be a little bit more strategic about planning out your year, thinking about what your goals are, what direction you want to go in, how you're going to get there. And then when it comes to the marketing side of things, you mentioned about those different options and all being, they're all sorts of different tactics, aren't they? But picking the right one to align with your goals. As you mentioned, if you're needing to get some money in in the next month, like you don't want to launch a YouTube channel. Something I wanted to just kind of touch upon though is this thing about being a CEO. So many small business owners, particularly sole practitioners, they, they won't consider themselves to be a CEO. And dare I say it, some of them may not even know what a CEO is. Like, what does that even mean? So for those that aren't familiar with the term, could you just explain, like, what is a CEO? Yeah, that's such a good question. And funnily enough, I, <laughs> I think I address it in my, in my podcast, or certainly at the start of my, my training that goes along with my um business strategy planner because yeah I don't think I would really know what a, a CEO was and I kind of knew the CEO was like the head honcho but I didn't really understand what that meant but basically it's your chief executive officer so that's the person who's you know leading the organization and beneath that and if you've worked in corporate you'll you'll know that you've got your c-suite so you might have you know sales or marketing or other kind of key uh, finance de you know departments where there's there's somebody kind of leading um, that department um but I saw a really interesting post on, on LinkedIn recently, which I had to respond to, where this lady was saying, and I really like her stuff, actually, but she was saying, oh, oh, isn't it annoying when people say that they're a CEO of a business? And obviously having a podcast called The Courageous CEO Podcast, I had to like jump on there. And I said, well, yeah, I know what you mean. I said, and I personally wouldn't, if somebody said to me, you know, sometimes when you go to someone's website and it says, oh, um, like we do this and we do that and you know it's just the one person and she yeah. was like oh you know they say I'm a CEO but um you know it's just me and my cat but <laughs> for me <laughs> I literally do have a cat on my desk at the moment with me but um but for me it's more about being as calling yourself a CEO you don't even have to tell people that that's what you're calling yourself it's just just seeing seeing yourself as having a business um rather than than being a freelancer or a contractor. And, and actually, just to be honest, something I often say to people, and it often stops them in their tracks, is if you're a freelancer or a contractor, you don't really have a business. Because if you stopped doing what you were doing tomorrow, like you've got nothing to sell. Your business wouldn't be able to run without you. So you, you don't have a business. And so actually some of the episodes on my Courageous CEO podcast, and this is why I changed my own content strategy a little bit, because I wanted to attract maybe a different sort of business owner or more of the type of business owner that I think really get where I'm coming from with this. So I've, I've done episodes on growing a business to sell or, you know, generating recurring revenue or, or you know, finding ways um, to make your business work without you. Now, some people will, some people think, oh, that means I need an agency or I need a practice, but it isn't necessarily that. But thinking about, well, you know, even if there's just one or two of you, like how can I create a business which isn't reliant on me being in front of my clients all the time? Because a CEO isn't, you know, if the CEO's traveling or doing meetings or you know, off somewhere, no, the business doesn't grind to a halt. And I think that is the difference. It's the difference between having a business that is just you basically delivering. And if you're not around to deliver, nothing happens, but also you're not creating anything of value. Um, and actually, you don't have to have a practice to have something of value to sell. And it could be like in my case, um, I, I have a small team of um, contractors, but I don't have, I don't actually have anybody on staff, but I've got assets. So I've got digital products that generate return, recurring in, it, uh, income. I've got my um, planner and the resources go alongside it. I've basically got things that, could, that, are, that to the right person will be valuable. So somebody come along and want to buy it. Obviously, if you want that to happen, having, proper systems and processes in place in your business, the sorts of things that you can do. I've got a podcast episode about this um, to make your business more value, valuable. But that's really what I'm talking about is having a business that if you're not able to show up one day or you're sick or you've got something else going on, there are ways. And it doesn't mean there's like one way for that to happen, but it could run without you. And there's yeah. so many different models. But 
you don't have a if you're a freelancer or a contractor you don't have a business basically because you're in business maybe you might say but you don't have a business and this is exactly what happened with me i'd decided i was going to start a business and i created another job yeah. So that that was me. Yeah. And I, I was going to ask a question, which I think you've kind of answered it already, just about how um, are all small business owners really CEOs, whether they call themselves that or not. But I think from what you've explained that all business owners, even kind of freelancers or those starting out to grow their business, whether they call themselves a CEO, they probably should try and think like a CEO to at least do some of those activities like the strategic planning that many of them don't do. But actually, until they get to the point where they've developed the business enough in whichever direction it goes, whether that's um, creating products that can be sold without them needing to be present or building a team to help deliver the services, that actually, unless it runs without them there, it isn't actually really a business yet. Yeah, yeah. If, if you weren't around or, you you know, you were unwell or you weren't able to work for whatever reason, that business just wouldn't operate, would it? Um, and that's why I say there's nothing wrong with being a freelancer or a contractor. If that's how you want to work, then great. I did it for years and I absolutely loved it. But if you're thinking, well, actually, I want to grow something that possibly I could scale or sell or that isn't really, mm -hmm. that, that maybe I can retire early or, or maybe I can... Uh, reduce my hours and build a team to you know something that's an asset that's something of, of value or it isn't always about money it could be about leaving a legacy or whatever whatever you build that that can't really just be reliant on you because otherwise it's not a, a business and it's actually the first time I've said it but you've helped me make a better distinction really which is kind of like you're in business but you don't have a business, I think, if you see what I mean. You're, you're in yeah. business, you're doing business with people, but that's not the same as having a business because a business will generally be something that has some commercial value that, you know, somebody, the right person may be interested in in investing in. And also, I mean, for me, CEO thinking is also deciding whether you want that as well because having a practice or a team or having um, even their passive income, like I have so-called passive income problem <laughs> products, they're not passive at all. You know, Christmas Day, if something goes wrong, uh, someone tries to buy one of my digital products, it probably will be me that has to jump on and try and fix it. Okay, as the CEO of, of our business or, or in thinking like a CEO, in trying to grow and create a business if we're in business but don't necessarily have one, what are the key things that we should be doing that we might not be doing already? Remember, don't forget to subscribe to my free weekly email newsletter. You can do that at mrjohnclayton.co.uk forward slash ABC. And if you enjoy this episode, then please visit podchaser.com, search for Architecture Business Club and leave a five star review. Now back to the show. Yeah, so the first one we've touched on quite a lot, which is obviously strategic planning and having that you know, forward planning, knowing where you're going and then working out the best tactics to get there. Um, data, so you, tracking data, know what data you're going to track. Again, the reason that a CEO of a big company can tell, could tell you, if they would tell you, they probably wouldn't, what their financial goals are or whatever, and they can publish a, a report every year, um, is because they're tracking. So they're, they're looking at sales, they're looking at increases, decreases they're looking at you know which product lines or which services are selling the best you know they're they're, they're making decisions about what to continue with and 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 you know what what isn't worth their investment of time and resources so tracking data so for example i gave an i think i said this earlier but a lot of clients will say they'll, they'll pluck a figure out the air of how much they want to earn i say okay well how are we going to get there um oh well I, i'm not really sure like what, what are your best selling products or services oh well i, I don't really know um, and the other thing is actually commercial viability and this is something I've been starting to talk about a lot and actually my choir was probably quite a good example because um you can have a, some sometimes I think and I, I think it may be less less so in the architectural industry but you'd be able to uh, put me right on that but a real common problem I see is people trying to sell things that they want to deliver but people don't want to buy <laughs> um and and so you might feel really passionate and you might think that all the people that you, your ideal customers and clients need to have these skills or need to have this service. But if they don't get that, it doesn't matter how, how, how you put it. So, so my best, um, top, most downloaded podcast actually in my latest series was 
is your online course commercially viable? Like, how do you know if people want to buy something? And the truth is, you'll never know whether people want to buy a particular product or service until you actually you know, get out there and and um, put it on the market. But really understanding what your ideal customers or clients' problems are and making it your business to find out what it is. I did something interesting, actually. On a, I, I ran a virtual event recently and to show people what I meant by this, <laughs> so it's quite risky. I do like to take a risk. But I said, look, I'm going to create an offer with you on live. I mean, I'm going to write the copy, the sales copy for this offer. Uh, and it was actually a, a one-off consulting session. And I said, look, if you could do like 90 minutes with me and I could help you like achieve like a particular goal within a 90 minute session, like what would you want? And what they all said was um, they would want me to help them create a commercially viable offer. So to, to really kind of like hone, it could be a new service or it could be uh, something that they already had that wasn't selling very well. And crucially have the copy, like, so that, so because yeah. another problem is, I think, is if you could have a great product or service that really transforms people's businesses or lives or whatever, but if you can't find the right words to say that, or you're not able to articulate the value of it, then it's not going to sell. Um, so I think that's really important as well. So understanding your value having social proof that you can deliver the results that you say you can and really be able to have those commercial conversations. So again, you know, a CEO of a company, while they might not be doing it themselves, something they really do understand is how it delivers value, what the transformation is and, and being able to do great sales calls. And again, a CEO like wouldn't necessarily be doing those themselves, but they would understand the importance of having people who can have great sales conversations, who can write a great proposal, who understands a team of marketers or whether who can understand how to sell the benefits of it. it. It's a lot. And so I think that's a really understanding commercial viability, understanding how to create products or services people want to buy, being able to have great sales conversations, really listen to what people are saying. And when I said at the beginning about people not knowing how to get a client, it was just such a shock for me because, and it was, I think because of all this uh, like online, you know, make millions overnight, all those sort of things out there. I was getting people who literally had invested in like every program under the sun um, marketing wise, but just didn't know basic stuff. Like, you know, the easiest way to get a client is probably to go to a networking event <laughs> or probably to make a list of people you've worked with before or old colleagues and ask for recommendations or referrals. So I think making it your business to to get those kind of business skills because you are a salesperson. Do you think that part of that is that people will sometimes gravitate to the sales and marketing activities that feel in their zone of comfort? Yeah, exactly. And I think it's because um, there's that risk of rejection. So if you post some stuff on Instagram and no one replies, you can say, oh, oh, well, it was the algorithm or whatever. You can blame it on something else or, or just say perhaps people aren't interested. If you email somebody and ask for a referral or if you um, reach out to a previous client and say hey I've got some space in the diary and I was thinking about you for this that's you're more likely to get rejected aren't you um, and so people spend a lot of time I think procrastinating a real learning for me over the last decade is how much people will move towards the marketing activity sometimes because they think they're fun like personally I think it's much more fun <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, but also sometimes because they're scared of being rejected but actually if you can master these essential skills of knowing how to get clients, real old school, make a list of who you've worked with before or what connections you've got, ask for recommendations, referrals, know how to reach out to people, follow up, have those conversations. That that's your key to freedom in a way. Because if you if you really if you can get really commercially minded and you can you can get good at that stuff, you know, I generated about five grand of income in about half an hour or something. Yeah. Um, no fancy sales pages, by the way. I didn't I I I sent the offer, I'm not joking even, um, on a Google Doc. No no fancy sales pages or whatever, because if people feel that you understand their problem and you're able to articulate that, they, they will buy. I have this great idea and then I'll spend months writing the copy for it and investing money in a new sales page on the website, totally reverse engineering that the way that you've done it by getting yourself in front of your ideal audience and asking them, actually surveying the audience and saying, what are you struggling with? What are those biggest struggles? And what what would be the ideal way for me to help you with those? What's the outcome that you've been looking for? And what would you be willing to pay for it? Actually reverse engineering it that way, I think is like genius. Such a good idea. 
can I pick up on, on that question? What would you be willing to pay? That's actually a question that I, I feel personally you should never ha have to ask if you understand your value. And if you ask somebody, what would you be willing to pay? They'll go, either I don't know, or they'll say as little as possible, right? <laughs> now, CEO <laughs> thinking is people will pay what that transformation is worth to them. So people often ask me questions about pricing. Mm. So for I'll give you an example. So I sell strategic copywriting campaigns and they start at £5,000. And, and so what I do is I do, um, somebody might come to me and they've got a very specific uh, launch in mind or, and whatever. And and for the, for the wrong client, they'll go, oh my God, £5,000 or whatever. <laughs> for the right client, they go, brilliant. So I'm yeah. going to get somebody who's going to, who, who's going to take the time to really understand my product or service, who's going to help me look at every part of the process and the funnel, sales page, emails, social media, page, whatever we decide, you know, whatever the, is going out. Somebody who's got the experience, who's done it before, has got the social proof, you know, and has got all the testimonials to say that they've helped people get great results. I worked with a client recently who she had a group uh, program and she was doing all right. Like she, she was, getting people in but she was just really busy delivering and she wasn't she, she wanted to increase the numbers and she just wanted it to feel easy so I worked with her uh to work all, on all of her content uh the strategy crucially and um she she generated 22 leads for that and she only needed 10 before she even wow. opened the enrollments this price of her program I think was about two and a half thousand so she's going to make that calculation and go well if I am able to sell two of these like two more than I normally do like this is a great investment and it's not just an investment for now. It's an investment because she does it four times a year and I've got rinse and repeat process that I can tweak. So for the right client, you can charge what you like. And also remember people are buying your years of experience. CEO thinking is not like how much do people want to pay, but it's actually what what is my service worth? And And for someone who is going to invest in this service or product, like, if you've got the social proof, I can really competently charge that because I know that I've delivered that result. We could talk for hours on this, this whole the whole pricing thing. Uh, one little point I wanted to just touch upon was that I think one of the key things is communicating the value that's mm. being offered, particularly in architecture. A lot of people um, are still looking at it like we're exchanging time for money. You know, they might not be selling the services by the hour necessarily, but Often it can be a fixed price that's based on an estimated number of hours. But that thing you mentioned, it's not just the fact that with your service that they're getting the the campaign written for them or the course created. They're, they're paying for all that experience. And I think that's one of the huge disadvantages for those consultants that do charge hourly. You deliver the service quicker and you get penalised if you charge by the hour. You get less money, which is absolutely bonkers. You're delivering a better more efficient service for the customer and you get paid less totally doesn't add up at all and that's me having a little bit of a rant about that um, <laughs> yeah. so i'll get off my soapbox but that, i mean um, that's a key skill is about being able to design offers and services and to um when someone comes to you and says um oh how much would it be for this you having that conversation with them um i just an example i often give is like i i was approached by university a few years ago to do some training for them um, and it was thousands and thousands of pounds. So at the time, didn't know any better. I was like, yeah, great, whatever. When I got there, it was like a hornet's nest because they'd basically hired an advertising agency to create this like branding style guide and brought me in to teach writing for the web because they wanted all of their academic staff to to write stuff for the website and upload it, but they hadn't told anyone. Right? <laughs> so me now would have said, well, I need to have a sales call. You know, I don't just do a day rate. I'd have listened to what they said and I would have said, well, look, you know, my expert advice is you need to, there's a bit of communication work you need to do there to make sure everybody knows about it on board. I'm happy to help you with that, but I can't deliver these workshops without this key communication piece. And so that potentially could have been, you know, 5,000 into 15 or 20,000. So it's also about that as well, about, about ha when you're, you're quite skilled at having those sales conversations, you can take a relatively small, you know, oh, it's this many hours and potentially, if you really understand what the needs are, it doesn't mean everyone's going to say yes to it, but you can actually go back with a bigger piece of work. Janet, that has been absolutely brilliant. I think there's there's so many um, 
you know takeaways from that episode it's been really really useful is there anything else that you wanted to say uh, particularly about ceo mindset and thinking like a ceo that we haven't already covered in the course of the conversation i think we've covered most things haven't we but i think it is just about having the bigger picture it's okay to be a freelancer or a contractor like that's fine um but if you if you want your business to be able to run without you, if you potentially want something that you could sell that's got value or that could generate income when you're not around, the CEO thinking will really help and just being more, and, you know, just help you make more money. Um, that example I just gave there is potentially taking, you know, a couple of thousands worth of work to, you know, multiple tens of thousands. And, and, it, and you know, even if you do want to be a freelancer or a contractor, just thinking more strategically and, this is something I haven't mentioned actually, is confidence as an expert. So there's, okay, we could do a whole episode on this, but I think a lot of people lack confidence when they go out into the in, into the market, you know, having been employed by a firm and they, they have this kind of, I'll take what I get mentality, but you are an expert and um, having the confidence to say, actually, I know you, you wanted to have a conversation with me about this, but from what you've said, I, I I think you actually need to do this, this, and this, and and having the confidence to to um to say no as well. And again, a CEO, you know, doesn't just say yes to everything, including things that aren't aligned with, you know, their their business vision. Um, I think a freelancer contractor mentality can also be, oh, I'll just take everything that comes my way. <laughs> um, and actually, when you're more uh, secure on who it is you want to work with, how you want to work with them, and you've got that vision. Um, generally, everything is a lot easier. But um, hopefully, that's just a helpful addition. There's probably loads more, but that's some, um, yeah, just yeah. that kind of self confidence. Absolutely, yeah, that's something that's so lacking uh, with so many people. And um, the power of of saying no, actually, you know, if you're saying yes to one opportunity, you're saying no to another. So actually, being brave to be able to say no, particularly when you. Sometimes you get a gut instinct, don't you, about whether somebody's going to be a good client or not. And um, yeah, I've started to say no a lot more over the years. I, I started out and it was yes to everything, uh, yeah. but not, any, not anymore, thankfully. Um, Janet, there was just one other question I wanted to ask. Um, it's not topic related, but I, I love to travel and discover new places. And I just wondered if you could tell me like one of your favorite places and what you love about it. Just out of interest and curiosity, it could be anywhere. It could be the end of your street or somewhere <laughs> on the other side of the world. Is there anywhere that springs to mind as one of your favourite places? Yeah, I've travelled quite a lot with work all over the place and there isn't a particular place that stands out, a place where I feel very comfortable. Um, I was actually, although it sound like it, I was born in Liverpool and um, I think it's an amazing place and a, a wonderful city and I certainly feel very at home there. Um, but yeah, that doesn't sound very good, does it? I feel like I should be saying something more like exciting. Um, but I think any travel or any new place I've visited always has something to offer um, in terms of just meeting new people and having new experiences. So yeah, I wish I could say something that sounded a bit more. No, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. Liverpool, Liverpool's an awesome city. I've, um, I didn't visit there up until probably within the last... I don't know, five to 10 years of my life. And I I can't even remember the specific reason. I think I went for like a city break there with my wife. We had an amazing time, such a fantastic city. So definitely recommend people go visit if you've never been before. And an amazing history of music as well, if people are into music. Yeah. Could you just remind everybody, um, firstly, where's the best place for people to connect with you? If they want to connect with you online, get in touch with you, where, where's the best place for them to do that? So I think probably I have a Facebook page, which is Janet Murray Facebook business uh, business strategy, uh, Facebook page, business strategist and copywriter. Um, but I'm everywhere else where, where online. Um, and um, I had the podcast, the Serate Courageous CEO podcast. And if what I've been saying about these strategic skills has really resonated and you're like, yes, I need to know about all of that stuff, my Courageous CEO um, strategic business planet and resource kit um, has got 
a comprehensive business strategy training, audio training, because I'm a podcaster, which goes through all of this stuff, you know, how to come up with commercially viable offers, how to put together um, packages, how to design them, how to write copy that sells your um, sells your products or services, um, also how to um, have sales calls and follow up and write great proposals. So a lot of those foundational skills that a lot of us, we get in business and like we kind of get some of them and then sometimes we have to go back sometimes and fill in the gaps. I certainly had to. Well, it's basically what I wish I had when I'd started all the mm. templates. So templates for sales calls, follow up, uh, as well as thousand social media templates. Um, basically anything you need to do in your business, I have a template for it. I've basically just given everything that I use every day in my business um, to, to help me generate sales and consistent sales. Um, so it's the 2024 Career- Courageous CEO Strategic Business Planet and Resource Kit. It's a massive mouthful. Mouthful. It's even harder to say than architect. <laughs> or, um, <laughs> but I actually, but I managed it. Um, and uh, there's a special discount code, um, which is um, John97, um, which will get you £50 off. Um, and my discount code's providing you know, the, the products still available. Uh, they're live for 90, 90 days. Oh, that's absolutely awesome. Thank you so much, Janet. I will make sure that those links and the discount code go in the podcast show notes. So if you're listening to the podcast, uh, just go and check out the show notes on your podcast app of choice. Go and look at the description. All the links will be in there. Go ahead and grab one of those from Janet. Um, I've bought lots of products from Janet before and attended all of events and everything that she creates is absolutely amazing and ever so useful. So please go ahead and take advantage of that discount. Okay, Janet, thanks again. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks so much for having me. Next time, I'll be chatting with Laura Robinson about bite-sized one-to-one experiences, otherwise known as first date offers, that can lead your clients towards your higher priced services. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Architecture Business Club. If you liked this episode, think other people might enjoy it, or just want to show your support, then please visit podchaser.com, search for Architecture Business Club, and leave a glowing five-star review. It would mean so much to me and makes it easier for new listeners to discover the show. If you just want to connect with me, you can do that on most social media platforms. Just search for at Mr. John Clayton. The best place to connect with me online, though, is on LinkedIn. You can find a link to my profile in the show notes. Remember, running your architecture business doesn't have to be hard, and you don't need to do it alone. This is Architecture Business Club. 